Founded in the year 1209, Cambridge is one of the most respected and well-known institutions of higher learning on earth. The university is comprised of 31 constituent colleges, including the prestigious Queen's College, co-sponsor of this event. In continuous operation for over 560 years, Queen's College was founded in 1448 by Queen Margaret of Anjou and refounded in 1465 by Queen Elizabeth Woodville. Queen Elizabeth II is its current patroness. Including structures dating from 1460, the President's Lodge has housed all 39 presidents of Queen's College. Its residence since 1997, Lord John Eatwell. Extraordinary academic achievement. World-renowned architecture. The richest of histories. Cambridge University holds an unassailable place in the pantheon of great institutions of higher education. Lord Eatwell is a true Renaissance man, 18-year president of Queen's College at the University of Cambridge in Britain, director of the Center for Financial Analysis and Policy at Cambridge's Judge Business School, two-decade Labor member of the House of Lords, serving as Labor's front bench spokesperson for Treasury and Economic Affairs, founder of the Institute uh, for Public Policy Research, one of, British, uh, one of Britain's leading think tanks, internationally recognized economist, elected foreign member of the Italian Academy of Sciences, chair of the British Library and member of the Royal Opera House Board of Directors with particular responsibility for the Royal Ballet, Educated at Harvard and Cambridge, Lord Eatwell has been a teaching fellow at Harvard University, a visiting professor at Columbia University, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, uh, and the University of Amsterdam, and a professor of economics at, Southern, at the University of Southern California. His political career includes a seven-year post as chief economic advisor to Neil Kinnock, the then leader of the Labor Party. Lord Eatwell is a member of the Securities and Futures Authority, Britain's security market regulator, and is a prolific writer on matters related to securities res regulation, uh, primarily risk management in financial institutions. Please join me in welcoming the president of Queen's College at the University of Cambridge, Lord Eatwell. Well, thank you so much, Governor. And it is my special pleasure on behalf of Queen's College to welcome you all here. It's been a, a joy, really, to be the co-hosts uh, of this extraordinary conference. And I think we're going to have both an exciting but most informative and important time. I'm going to begin with a text taken from the writing of the distinguished American philosopher and educationist John Dewey. Dewey wrote... If we teach today's students as we taught yesterday's, we rob them of tomorrow. Now, as president of a college that was founded, as you've seen, 566 years ago, and that rather prides itself on the strength of its traditional teaching practices, Dewey's proposition, though very much in tune with the themes of this conference, might be, for me, a rather uncomfortable starting point. Indeed, at first sight, Queen's College Cambridge is the most improbable co-sponsor of this conference, since its whole teaching philosophy could be seen as the polar opposite of globalized education. The traditional teaching method for which we at Queen's and other colleges at Oxford and Cambridge are famous, in what, is, uh, what in Oxford is called the tutorial system and in Cambridge is called the supervision system. They're actually the same thing. Under the tutorial system, each undergraduate meets for at least one hour a week with a senior academic, sometimes alone or more typically in pairs. The student has prepared a piece of set work for the professor and spends the hour discussing it in detail. The essay or the problem set is thoroughly dissected and the student's understanding is tested. 
Then a new piece of work is set and the, for the following week, and so it goes on. And typically, a student will have three of these tutorials every week. These college tutorials are given in parallel with the large set-piece lectures and laboratory work that are organized by the university. By the way, to understand Oxford and Cambridge, the university is the federal government, the colleges are the states. So I'm a state governor too. <laughs> so as well as testing students' understanding of the material, the tutorial provides a counterpoint to the material presented in lectures. The student is party, if you like, to a critical dialogue between two or more professors. Now, an obvious reaction to this system is that it's extraordinarily labor-intensive and potentially very expensive. It is. We only managed to sustain it in Cambridge by underpaying our academics <laughs> and providing them with a fine wine cellar. <laughs> Another obvious point is that access to such a teaching system is severely limited. Indeed, it is the stated policy of Cambridge University that the total number of undergraduates should not increase. There's a bar on the number of students who can access a Cambridge education. A third point to make in line with the theme of this conference is that Cambridge is nonetheless a global university, but only in the sense that the world comes to Cambridge. Indeed, Cambridge is an example of what we can call the first and still dominant form of globalization of higher education. From the very beginnings of universities centuries ago, scholars and students have traveled to universities. Erasmus, the great humanist philosopher and theologian, came to Queens in, uh, from Rotterdam in 1506 to work on his translation of the New Testament into Greek. In 1895, Ernest Rutherford came from the other side of the world, from New Zealand, to found modern atomic physics in Cambridge. In 1902, the first large-scale international program of scholarships, the Rhodes Scholarships, brought students from around the world to Oxford. In the 60s, I myself was a Kennedy Scholar at Harvard. Today, a multitude of scholarship schemes span the globe to take students from their homelands to foreign universities, especially to universities in the English-speaking world. In most leading universities, well over a half of all graduate students and up to a quarter of undergraduates are foreign nationals. This diversity is an important part of what makes a great university great. A second form of globalization has seen universities establishing branches overseas taking the university to the students. The experience here has been decidedly mixed, particularly with respect to sustaining the quality of education offered. Some overseas branches have undoubtedly been successful, but others have failed. Certainly, the rush to establish overseas campuses that occurred over the last 20 years has slowed down, and it may even be in retreat. Then we move to the third form of globalization that was made possible from the mid-19th century onwards by the development of distance learning. The first modern correspondence course was launched by Sir Isaac Pittman in the 1840s. Pittman taught a system of shorthand by mailing text transcribed into shorthand on postcards and receiving, in return, transcriptions from his students for correction. This element of student feedback was a crucial innovation of Pittman's distance learning system. Now, this scheme was made possible by an important logistical development, the introduction of uniform postage rates across England from 1840. Then, in 1858, Queen Victoria chartered the external program of the University of London, making it the first university to offer distance learning degrees to students. This program is now known as the University of London International Program and includes postgraduate and undergraduate degrees and diploma courses 
created by institutions such as the London School of Economics. London's example, in this case, was fo followed in the US in the 1890s by Columbia University and then by the University of Chicago. Moving on to the 20th century, here radio and then television created entirely new opportunities for the development of distance learning. An important modern development was the creation of the Open University by the British Labour government in 1969. The Open University revolutionized the scope and content of distance learning programs, and in doing so, created a totally credible learning alternative, real credibility as an alternative to traditional campus-based higher education. The OU has been at the forefront of developing new technologies to improve the distance learning experience. And I'm delighted that Martin Bean, its vice chancellor, and Sir John Daniel, a former vice chancellor, are with us today, and we'll be hearing from them later this morning and tomorrow. Now, what's most striking about these innovations in distance learning, innovations with the potential for extending access on a global scale, is whilst they have seen significant growth, until now, higher education has remained essentially unchanged. Indeed, if anything, the traditional university campus has become a more dominant form of educational delivery than ever before. That's a conundrum. But however, today, we are faced with the most radical change in distance learning, technology, and logistics since the invention of the printed book. Of course, it's a cliche. But the revolution in information and communications technology has transformed and is transforming the world. For the potential globalization of knowledge, really only the invention of printing has been more important. Today, we have available a veritable cornucopia of multimedia learning, technology-enhanced learning, computer-based instruction and training, internet-based training, learning platforms, and digital education collaboration, all based on numerous types of media that deliver text, audio, images, animation, streaming video, and include technological applications and processes such as audio or videotape, satellite TV, CD-ROMs, as well as local internet, extranet, and web-based learning. All these are available. The new technology has heralded the arrival of MOOCs, those massive online open courses, to enthusiastic fanfares, resulting in all online platforms being labeled MOOCs, even when they're not. But despite the headline visibility of global MOOCs, it won't be MOOCs that will change the face of higher education. Because MOOCs are not in themselves revolutionary. They are essentially virtual textbooks, targeted, evaluated, and suitably accredited learning programs are far more important. It's these programs, together with big data analysis, that will transform global education. The new techniques of big data analysis will revolutionize online learning, and in doing so, global higher education. The collection of data at every step of the learning process will give institutions the predictive tools needed to improve learning. Teaching and learning can be tailored to the individual according to the evaluation and assessment of past activity collected during the learning process. So now learning can occur in or out of the classroom, anywhere on the globe. It can be self-paced, asynchronous learning, or it can be instructor-led, synchronous learning, and it can be tailored to individual need. And all this can take place on a global scale. As Governor Hunt said, what could be a bigger idea than that? And that's why this conference is so timely. The pace of development over the past few years have been so rapid and so transformative that whilst we know that there are many changes to come, 
Now is a good time to stand back and take stock, to assess how far global potential has changed. What are the implications for the future? And what can we do now to ensure that the future fulfills its potential? I believe that this conference faces at least three big questions. What can be achieved? What will happen to the traditional university? And what is global about global education? So first, what can be achieved? There can be no doubt that the new technologies offer exciting educational possibilities on a global scale. And the movement of hundreds of thousands of students around the world, particularly students from Asia, and a very expensive process that has characterized the past few decades, points to an enormous unsatisfied demand for quality higher education. Now, we have the technological means of meeting a greater proportion of that demand off campus, and to meet it in an entirely new creative way. As Darrell West of the Brookings Institution has written recently, and I quote, students master vital skills and critical thinking in a personalized and collaborative manner. Teachers assess pupils in real time, and social media and digital libraries connect learners to a wide range of informational sources. Teachers take on the role of coaches. Students learn at their own pace. Technology tracks student progress, and schools are judged based on the outcomes they produce. Rather than limited to six hours a day for half the year, this kind of education moves towards 24-7 engagement and learning full-time. Now, this enthusiastic vision has, however, encountered some critics who have argued that the online globalization of higher education faces limitations. And we have to confront these critical arguments. First, there's the argument that there are limitations imposed by the social content of education. At the beginning, I quoted John Dewey on the need for educational change. Dewey also argued that education and learning are social and interactive processes. And thus, the school itself is a social institution through which change can and should take place. He was clearly right. It's an old truism that at a good university, you learn more from your fellow students than you do from the professors. In addition, the personal contact between student and teacher is a vital component in ensuring that the student not, has not only absorbed and can reproduce knowledge, but understands and can use what has been learned. And then there's that sheer marvelous serendipity of a scholarly community. The pure mathematician chatting to a plant scientist over lunch, and the two of them solving a fundamental problem in genetics. The law student working with the mathematician on new structures of financial modeling. The bored student in the library who reaches up to take a random book from the shelf and appreciates it and experiences an epiphany. All these are actually real examples from Cambridge, including the bored student. <laughs> Some of these social issues can and are being tackled in the new technological environment. Virtual student communities can achieve much of what is achieved in real student communities whilst actually avoiding the costs associated with large gatherings of young people discovering and experimenting with the temptations of the world. Social media are making daily life an online phenomenon. Educational social life can be an online phenomenon too. It should also be remembered that Dewey believed that students thrive in an environment uh, where they are allowed to experience and interact with the curriculum. And all students should have the opportunity, he said, to take part in their own learning. 
Now here, the new technologies actually have the edge over to the traditional classroom. The latest online resources provide a variety of opportunities to interact and devise personalized learning plans. Big data te techniques, as I said earlier, enhance the personal sensitivity of course delivery. Evaluation, tuition, and even course content will respond in customized form to the emerging profile of the student. Now, another criticism that's been made of online education is that it's severely limited because of the need to work, of some students to work in laboratories. Now, it's true that a lot of teaching in physical and biological sciences and in technology and engineering does take place in laboratories, working with often complex and very expensive equipment. Now, I have no doubt that technological advance will mean that more and more experimentation is done on a computer screen, whether on campus or not. Indeed, this is happening already. But it seems likely that there will always remain a significant gap between the virtual laboratory and the real laboratory. Now, this doesn't mean that online science and technology courses are ruled out. What it does mean is that courses in scientific and engineering modeling and theory will need to be supplemented by some campus time in the lab. Now, this leads us on to our second major question. What will happen to the traditional university? Two contrasting facts are, I think, important to take into account. First, over 150 years, the development of distance learning has done little to stem the growth of demand for traditional universities up until now. Maybe this time it's different. Moreover, higher education on today's scale in the US and the UK is becoming extremely expensive, and that is making a difference. Now, it's been argued by some that the new educational technology spells the end of many traditional universities. Online access to the very best courses taught by professors from elite universities will outcompete the inferior materials presented at less prestigious institutions. Colleges will be hollowed out, and professors will be reduced, as we heard earlier, to the status of coaches. Well, frankly, I don't believe that. I see the new technology as changing university practice, not eliminating it. For universities are not solely teaching institutions. They are also the most important research institutions we have. It's university research that transforms our world. And there's a crucial synergy between teaching and research. A research active community is a great teaching community, and vice versa. Those university systems that have separated teaching and research, as is the case in Germany with the proliferation of the Max Planck Institutes, have seen the relative decline of both. So for the past 70 years in the UK and the US, there has existed a critical, unwritten contract between society and the universities. We'll pay you to teach and then you can have some time for your research. And research is even more of a social activity than is teaching. We cannot generate first-class, globally attractive courses without research-active academics. And research-active academics inhabit communities of bricks and mortar. So what the globalization of higher education is really about is expanding the boundary of the traditional university a great opportunity to project the campus worldwide by integrating the possibilities of online learning with a newly invigorated campus life and in the process sustaining excellence and protecting the brand. Yes, oh yes, the brand. That leads us on to our final major question. What's global about global edu uh, education? Now, an interesting example of the new online courses was launched just last week by Harvard Business School. And we look forward to hearing more 
about the new HBX online platform, as it's called, from Dr. Clayton Christensen uh, this afternoon. The online courses offered at uh, Harvard will be enhanced by what's called HBX Live. This is a virtual classroom allowing participants worldwide to interact with one another and with faculty members in much the same way as on the campus-based Harvard Business School class. They're overcoming the social problem. But this is interesting. One of the courses, one of the first courses, will deal with finance accounting. Now, this will, I'm sure, be an excellent course for American students. But it's unlikely that this course will ever be part of a package of global courses. This is because it will be of very limited value outside the US, since the principles and practice underpinning US accounting standards are different, quite different, from those used in most of the rest of the developed world. Now, this example shall alert us to the distinction between what can be truly global and what might be deemed partially global and what is almost exclusively national. Into the first category of the globally viable go mathematics and statistics, science and engineering, at least in the non-laboratory guys, medical science, although perhaps the practice of medicine is more national, languages, including classics, and a wide range of vocational courses, though many of these will need a nod to national idiosyncrasies. In the second category of the partially global are the social sciences, since typically these have strong national institutional specificities. And perhaps, and here I want to be controversial, history. We all know that the very best history isn't about facts. It requires interpretation. And interpretation is heavily laced with national culture. It's no accident that what Americans call the Revolutionary War, the British, who lost, refer to the War of Independence, almost making it sound like a good thing. <laughs> then, in the third category of the exclusively national are those fields that are heavily circumscribed by national factors. Legal practice is an obvious example as is the case of accounting standards that I mentioned earlier. Now, an interesting issue that we might address is whether the second and third less global categories are being eroded by the onward march of culture and economic globalization in the 21st century. I think there can be no doubt that the world has become more homogeneous in the last 50 years, widening the domain and potential of global education. But globalization is not an irreversible process. In my own field of economics and finance, the onward march of global markets has been reversed by the financial crisis. And the increasing balkanization of financial markets, and especially of financial regulation, now demands a more differentiated analysis than was previously the case. <laughs> However, there may be, after all this philosophizing, an altogether simpler answer to the question, what is a global education? Well, it's the education that is sought by communities across the globe and they're prepared to play for. So, to sum up, those I suggest are at least three of the big questions we need to address in this conference. What is a global education? Well, a global education is an education that comprehends the importance of cultural and national diversity. What are the implications for the future of universities? Those universities that grasp the opportunities are the universities of the future. And first, most exciting of all, what can be achieved? We can change the world. I began by contrasting the labor-intensive, limited-access model of higher education at Queen's College with this brave new educational world that the new technologies are creating. I confess that I made that contrast for effect. 
and it's wholly inaccurate. At Queen's, our 15th century buildings are penetrated by Wi-Fi. Specialist courses and other web-based material are an integral part of the teaching program. Research at Queen's is glo a globally linked online activity. But where we at Queen's are severely limited is in the provision of access to what we have to offer. How to promote greater access whilst preserving the very best of what we have is the challenge that this conference poses for us at Queen's. Indeed, it's a challenge for everyone working in higher education. I hope and believe that this conference will be an important step forward in confronting that challenge. Let's return to the text by Dewey. If we teach today's students as we taught yesterday's, we rob them of tomorrow. Thank you very much.